Welcome from the deep, I am Mike the Finder, and this is yet another episode of The Graveyard Shift. You know, when I think about werewolf movies, there's one that I think of that tops every other werewolf movie on the planet, and that is, obviously, American Werewolf in London. It's probably not only the most well-known, but it's also arguably the best. But when we're talking about werewolf movies, there is a very, 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 very close second. You are a walking second place man. <laughs> You guys want to see my butthole? What makes that even crazier is the movie that we're going to be talking about today was actually released before American Werewolf in London in the same year. It had the same special effects guy work on it, but it doesn't get the recognition that American Werewolf in London tends to get. Today we're talking about the very, very close second best werewolf movie of all time. That's my opinion! The Howling. Can I have a piece of toast? The Howling from 1981, it is rated R, directed by Joe Dante, written by John Salis and Terrence H. Winkless, stars Dee Wallace, Patrick Mackney, and Dennis Dugan. In this movie, we see Karen White, who is played by Dee Wallace. Dee Wallace is best known for E.T., Cujo, Critters, and she was also in a little movie called Red Christmas, which I did do a review of. I will link up top here and down below right now. She's not as good in that as she is The Howling, <laughs> or E.T. for that matter. You son of a... But nevertheless, we see Karen White as a reporter who is trying to chase down the serial killer. The serial killer has gotten in touch with her and said, hey, meet me at this adult theater and I will actually have a conversation with you about things that I've been doing and the people that I've been killing. Now, as a stand-up reporter does, she says, sure thing, I'll be right down there all by myself and I won't bring anybody else with me for backup. Okay, guys, this is it. I'll keep the transmitter open. can't quite figure out why she does this. I know she does promise the serial killer, hey, I'm gonna come alone, but like, you could probably just have a couple guys, I don't know, block back. Make sure you don't have some crazy situation happen whenever you meet this guy, which shocking is exactly what happened. She goes into this adult theater. The serial killer walks up behind her, hits play on this really cringy, awful porno. He turns into a werewolf. She gets all freaked out. The cops hear her screaming, come running in and shoot him down through the door. They didn't really know where they were shooting. Do you Wallace could have been behind that door and they would have just been shooting her. They're a little too late, they're a little too trigger happy, and end up killing the werewolf, or so they think. Now Karen is obviously extraordinarily traumatized by the events of this whole thing. Because she's so traumatized, she ends up going to a therapist. And the therapist says, hey, you're super traumatized from this whole thing. What I suggest is you go to this really remote mountain resort that I happen to own. There are a lot of other people there in this sort of same situation that are also super traumatized. And from there, everything starts to go crazy. And the rest of the movie is kind of just werewolves hunting down the people that are not not werewolves and killing them. It doesn't go much deeper than that, but I don't think it needs to because what you're really here for is the special effects and the kills. I will also say the music is just absolutely killer. It really adds to the whole atmosphere and really gives it a really creepy vibe. <laughs> But all in all, Joe Dante really directed the crap out of this, and you can really tell that he was gonna go on and make some really great stuff. The special effects are great. Even if Rick Baker did end up leaving the Howling production in order to go work on an American Werewolf in London, all the special effects that are in here are killer. I think that the really big transformation scene that's in this movie is not quite as well done as an American Werewolf in London. I think a lot of the money that went into an American Werewolf in London went into that scene, and they kind of worked around that, whereas it feels like in the Howling, kind of seems like they were running out of money or something for special effects that are pretty cool, but they don't quite hold up nearly as well as one would hope. There's also a moment next to the fire where Bill and Marsha are having sex and it is just a straight animated moment. Like it pulled me out of it so hard because it looks like it's right out of heavy metal or something and it just doesn't belong or fit the vibe of the rest of the movie at all. And I can't figure out why they did this. I feel like they had the werewolf suit and maybe it's because you don't ever see more than one werewolf on screen at a time. 
They do a lot of cuts to make it look like there are multiple werewolves on screen at one time. Unless I'm completely wrong and just missed it, there is not a single frame in this movie where there are two full werewolves on screen at once. It is pretty obvious that they had multiple werewolf hands and feet, so there are multiple appendages being used on screen at once. So maybe that's why they animated the whole fire scene, but it just feels like you have the werewolf suit, couldn't have just made one more werewolf head at the very least and shot like the fire behind them, then you would have two werewolf silhouettes instead of doing this weird animation. It's just such a bizarre choice to me. Other than that, all the special effects are dope. The transition scene that I was talking about earlier, it is killer. Regardless of how much better an American werewolf in London is, that is not to say the howling special effects are not awesome. It does seem like the transformation just keeps going and going and going and going and going. Shut up and get to the point! But it just comes off like they were just so stoked that it was working and that it looked good, that they wanted to show every single frame that they shot. But in the final edit, it does feel... Why is it so... Uh... Long? <laughs> There are also some other pacing issues that I have with this. The first 20 or 30 minutes of this are really slow. Once we do finally get up into the resort at the mountain, stuff starts to happen really quickly. The atmosphere is also something that stood out a lot to me. In the woods, I can't imagine how much fog they had to go through, but it really pays off because there's just this really thick atmosphere that stretches itself throughout the entire movie. And because it's the 80s, everything just feels kind of raw and gritty. And then you nail the atmosphere on top of that and then fantastic lighting. And and then the other thing that I was just completely blown away by was the camera work is phenomenal. There's so many good shots in this movie. It's not something that I was expecting to have a lot of fun with going into this, but man was I impressed by the cinematography. The acting is something else that I was really surprised about. If you did watch my review of Red Christmas, you will know that I didn't think Dee Wallace was that great in Red Christmas. Now this is around the same time she was doing Gremlins and E.T. and everything else, and she was really at the top of her game in this movie. Now I will say we are gonna have spoilers in this review. It's the only way to talk about this movie. This is a movie from 1981. I don't feel super bad about spoiling it, but if you would like to skip the spoiler section of a movie from 1981, I will link up top right here the timestamp that you can skip to in order to skip all of my spoiling. Now by the time Karen figures out what is happening, unbeknownst to her, Marcia has already turned Bill into a werewolf, so she's kind of on her own. So Karen ends up calling Terry. Terry and her boyfriend are kind of on the precipice of figuring out that these are actually werewolves and that the original serial killer that they're after is actually a werewolf. But when she finally figures out what is happening and that the serial killer goes after her, Karen ends up getting away from Eddie. She ends up throwing a vat of acid into his face and gets caught by two other people of the pack and they drag her to this barn out in the middle of the woods. And this is where we find out what has actually been happening the entire time. It turns out that everybody up at this resort is kind of in a werewolf cult. They don't make their end goals super well known, which is I think maybe my biggest issue in this movie. They're not really well to find stakes for what the werewolves are trying to actually accomplish. Not to mention the therapist ends up playing a huge part in all of this and it's not ever really even clear if he's a werewolf or not. I don't think that he is. I think he is just trying to help all of these people. The pack basically tells Karen, we don't like to do things the old way, which was like feeding on cows and animals and stuff like that. We're a bunch of werewolves and we like to eat people and you can't stop nature. The therapist is like, guys, we gotta control ourselves here. Nobody can actually know what's going on here. And if she disappears, She's like a famous TV journalist. People are gonna notice if she never comes back. She can't disappear, she's well known. He's right, Marsha. We gotta make this look like an accident. I won't let you do this. <laughs> and right then is when Terry's boyfriend with the silver bullet shows up. I started blasting. Bang. 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 Anyway, you guys all think I'm a hero. They get into a car, they drive away, and then right at the end, Karen gets bit by a werewolf. She goes on a newscast and tells the entire world, hey, there is a cult of werewolf people out there and they all want to turn you into werewolves and or eat you. Again, they're not super clear on the whole final end goal of this whole thing, but she ends up turning into a werewolf live on the news. And for me, I think that is the perfect way to end it. And the greatest part about it is they show a bunch of people like watching the news and some of them believed it, some of them didn't. And I actually think that's the perfect way to show how most people would react to a situation like that. Things I do with special effects these days. Did you see the one about the guy in the spaceship? It was real. He turned into a werewolf and they shot her. 
even though everybody was shown this on live TV, a lot of people are still like, that was special effects. And then at the very, very last second, we find out that Marsha ended up living and that leads into the sequel. I have seen some of the Howling sequels, but I haven't seen all of them. But for me, Howling 1 holds up really, really well. All in all, I think this is a really, really stupid, fun movie and really ahead of its time. The special effects are phenomenal. The camera work is great. The lighting is fantastic. The acting is really, really damn good. And I had a lot of fun with this movie. I had kind of higher expectations going into this because of how much I liked this when I watched this, I think in 2018 or 2019. My expectations were pretty damn high for this movie going into it, thinking there's no way it can live up. Well, it did. It lived up to all the expectations that I set up in my head for it. I am shocked at how much I enjoyed this and how well this has held up over the years. And it is all in all just a killer werewolf movie. And I think that because it kind of got overshadowed by an American werewolf in London by the general public, maybe not necessarily the hardcore horror community, that the howling doesn't necessarily get all the respect that it deserves. But a lot of the stuff that we think of as werewolves and a lot of the tropes and stuff like that come from this movie and an American werewolf in London. There are so many things in here that you see referenced in a lot of pop culture that you don't really realize that it's coming from the howling in an American werewolf in London. This movie is phenomenal and I'm gonna go ahead and rate this an eight out of 10. I loved this movie. I cannot express enough at how fun this is. If you've never seen The Howling, you are doing yourself a disservice. Most people I think have seen An American Werewolf in London. A lot of people I know specifically have never seen The Howling. And if you like werewolf movies, you gotta watch The Howling. It's so weird to me that The Howling 1 can be so damn good and yet spawns maybe one of the worst franchises in horror history. The sequels are not good. I've only seen a few of them, but the sequels that I have seen are real stinkers. But let me know what you thought. I know this movie is a little bit divisive when it comes to American Werewolf in London, The Howling, which is better? I don't know. The Wolfman and a whole bunch of others. We can talk about werewolf movies till we're blue in the face, but in my opinion, American Werewolf in London, strong second, The Howling. But I don't know, what do you guys think? Let me know down in the comments if you think The Howling is better than an American Werewolf in London. I'm sure somebody out there does. But if you like this, make sure you hit the like button. If you really liked it, make sure you hit the subscribe button because we got a lot more content like this on this channel. And thank you guys so much for watching. If you got all the way to the end of this, I really super appreciate it. And we will see you guys next time with another episode from the deep. Bye-bye.